morning, church, and welcome to Scarborough Community Alliance Church this morning. I want to invite you to stand up and greet someone that you don't know or someone that you know, but we are creatures of habit and we usually sit in the same pews that we sit, so go meet someone and shake someone's hand. brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome to all of you who are here and all of you who are online. And um, it's great to be here again to lead worship after uh, a few weeks of being away. As you know, we were in Portugal, and one of those Sundays that we were there, we attended church there, and the sermon was on the topic of greed. 
um, you know, the reality of acquiring more and more stuff that we cannot take uh, to heaven. So the pastor that morning challenged each one of us to learn to travel light. Now, we are all travelers here on this, in this world. And so as I was preparing for this morning sermon, um, I was reminded of the sermon in Portugal. Um, our passage this morning is 2 Peter 3, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. I'm going to read from 11 to 13. This is what it says. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. So this morning, I want to encourage us. Most likely, we are here. Um, we fill our time, our time, energy, money, with things that does not belong in the new heaven and the new earth. But one thing we do here on earth that we will continue to do in heaven is worship. So brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us this morning to take an inventory of what we are carrying around. And as we worship, let us turn our eyes to Jesus and give the things up to him and allow the spirit to move our hearts to worship. Who else would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. But this joy is mine. Sing forever. 
God, we cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. For indeed, you are the God who saves us, and you are worthy of all our praises. We thank you for the gift of today, the gift of life here on earth. But even more so, we praise you for you and your sacrifice in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the promise that you, our God, will one day dwell again with us, where you will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. So as we continue to live in the world that is constantly changing, we eagerly wait for your coming by standing on the promises of who you are. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Many of us here this morning may be overwhelmed by life, striving for unattainable perfection, juggling work, relationships, health issues. God, this morning, may we choose to see your goodness in the midst of our messy, imperfect lives, to recognize your mercies and faithfulness are new every morning. So as we sing this next song, continue to soften our hearts and open our eyes to who you are. Let's continue to sing. It's who you are. Treasure of greatest price, healer, giving me life, faithful again and again. Jesus, your love never.
Sorry, Pastor Sam. <laughs> Good morning, church. Um, now is the time for intercessory prayer, so let's bow our heads and pray together. Our dearest Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, we are so grateful to be able to come to worship you freely today. Help us to be still now in your presence this morning. Help us now to center our scattered thoughts and our senses on you. May we sit at your feet and be still to know that you are our God. Lord, may we hear your word this morning. Help us to hide your word in our heart deeply. May we guard our hearts from lies and attacks of the evil one that sows seeds of discontent, anxiety, fear, and hopelessness. Yet you, O oh Lord, are a shield around us, our glory and the lifter of our head. Your love is unconditional. Your grace is sufficient. Your timing is always perfect, although we often do not see or feel it. Help us to praise you for who you are, a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for providing our every need. And because you bless us, help us to bless others and pour generously into the others around us. Father, we know that you give us different seasons for everything under heaven. And Lord, we pray now for those who are in mourning. We pray for Anna and Victoria Lamb's family as they mourn the loss of their mother. Lord, as you welcome your faithful servant home, May you comfort those that she leaves behind. Be with Ed and Anna and their family. Help Anna be able to sleep properly this week as she plans and prepares. Be with Ron and Victoria's family as well. Surround them, Lord, with loved ones and the presence of your spirit so they may be comforted during this time. Lord, we thank you too for the season of birth as well. We are constantly overjoyed over all the new babies being born recently. We pray that you'll continually sustain all the parents with newborns, infants, and toddlers. We pray that for extra strength, extra grace over these parents, that they will find time to connect with you and with each other in the busyness. Lord, we also pray for our children's ministry. We thank you for providing us with a new core team. As this exciting ministry grows, may you provide wisdom and discernment in every step of planning. Would you continue to raise more teachers and helpers and give strength and renewed energy to those who are already faithfully serving? May you continually equip us to care for and teach the children of their church to know and to love you more. Father, we also pray over our youth and our young adults. Lord, may you surround our youth with godly people to be able to speak into their lives. Help them to grow in faith and in stature and desire to know you more. We pray for our young adults and the young adults ministry event tonight. We pray for the young adults in our church would find belonging and community at ESCOM and establish meaningful relationships with one another. Lord, Please give Nathan and Cynthia Lee and Pastor Sam discernment as they also plan for the vision for the fall. 
pray that young adults would seek you and put you at the center of their decisions during this time of their life. We pray over our elders meeting today, anoint us with wisdom and give us a spirit of unity as we discuss and plan and to lead and grow your church. May you continue to fill us now with your word as you speak to us this morning through Pastor Sam. In your most son's most precious and holy name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading today is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God, that, and that by means of these, the world then, that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any of you should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him, without spot or blemish, and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. And as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning, church. Good morning. We are so excited to be concluding our summer series through these letters of St. Paul to the early church. We're just praising God that these letters that were written to a first century Middle Eastern context is endowed with the same divine authority of the Spirit of God himself and the same divine principles to challenge us today and to give us an authority unto whom we can submit our lives so this morning we are finishing up 
the book of 2 Peter. And this morning in chapter 3, Peter is finishing this letter by reminding the church of God about Christ's integral promise to the church that he gave as a grand source of hope for their future and was meant to spur them on to endure hardships and to obey and follow Christ. The promise of what Peter calls the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness itself dwells. What an amazing picture that that paints for our minds. In the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet first spoke of this day where God was finally going to do away with this material world that is infected with sin and sickness and brokenness and completely overhaul all of creation to make it for his beloved children a new heaven and a new earth. No more sickness, no more sin, and no more suffering. And so the entirety of the early church erupted out of this pure belief in the promise of Christ, that he was going to one day return in glory and restore this fallen world to the glorious recreation of both heaven and earth, where the effects of sin on nature, on these mortal bodies that we have, and on our immortal souls would be done away with. But before that day was to come, there's promise of something that comes before that. Something promised called the day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, this idea of the day of the Lord, or rather the, uh, in some of the places it's called the day of visitation, or the day of his judgment, it was this Old Testament belief that while the people um, and the nations surrounding the Israelites in Canaan were committing all kinds of atrocities and evil against their fellow man and against God, God was storing up for themselves wrath for the wicked on what was called the day of the Lord. It was meant to be a sign and a promise of God's just judgment and punishment for all the evil committed in the land. However, as this history of God's people and of Israel progressed, it, so too it began, uh, Israel began participating in the same evils and sin of the surrounding nations. And so the prophets rose up among the people, warning them, that the day of the Lord was also a day of judgment for them as well. And Jesus again and again warns the people of Israel in the gospel to be watchful for the day that God would come to judge the people on account of their sin and rebellion against them, which is why Christ's gospel call is to all people to repent and believe the good news, to put their eternal trust in Christ's perfect life, death, and resurrection as the foundation of uh, their being made right with God, with their union with God, to be the foundation of their restored relationship with him. And only those who put their trust in Christ and began producing good works as a result of being transformed by the Spirit of God would be those who at the end, at the day of the Lord, would not be put to shame in judgment, but rather would enter into the peace and the rest of God's new heaven and new earth. And so this waiting for the day of the Lord was synonymous for the early church with the return of Christ, which is promised to his disciples in John 14. And so the explosion of the gospel post Christ's ascension to heaven was characterized by the early church's firm belief in the imminence of Christ's return and also characterized by a desire to see their Lord and their master once again and to bring his return quickly, to hasten it. This eager expectation of God to come in justice over the wicked was characterizing the, uh, the remnant of God since time immemorial. You know, back in about 2013, uh, movie star Mark Wahlberg starred in a very popular blockbuster called Lone Survivor. It was a movie that was based off of the true events of petty officer Marcus Luttrell, who was one of a, a platoon of Navy SEALs who were sent to northeastern Afghanistan to eliminate a major and uh, or a high-risk uh, Taliban target. And during this, uh, during this operation, Luttrell and his team, unfortunately, due to some extenuating circumstances, they were actually their, their cover was blown by a sheep herder, if you could believe it. Um, having their cover be blown, Luttrell's unit was systematically one by one gunned down. 
he himself um, being the only one who escaped. And even in the heat of escape, Luttrell sustained um, uh, an injury of three shattered vertebrae as a result of a steep fall and by the end had much shrapnel in his leg. And he was now alone in the Afghanistan wilderness without backup and in deep trouble. And so the rest of the story is really just the tale of his survival while awaiting reinforcements and backup and, of course, his eventual extraction from the war zone. It tells of is the tale of daring escapes, days and hours of hunger and thirst, near misses and close calls with detection from the Taliban, and finally his ultimate escape. And I can't help but wonder that with all the evil in the world, and with all the suffering and the persecution that Christians have endured for their faith since Christ's ascension, that many believers in history have felt an awful lot like Petty Officer Marcus Luttrell, feeling outgunned, under fire, and simply just waiting for reinforcements, waiting for the day of the Lord to come, like help to arrive, like reinforcements to arrive. This is how believers have felt all throughout human history, awaiting the return of their victorious Savior, finally to do away with sin and bring evil to justice. And so this is where we find ourselves this morning in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter is addressing, again, the infiltration of these false teachers into the community of Christ, where they were seeking to get these believers to doubt Christ's bodily return on the day of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, you can look with me in verses 1 through 4. This is what it says. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So as he's mentioned again in his previous letter, 1 Peter, Peter is seeking to stir up, again, sincere and fresh affections for Christ by reminding the people of God to remain true to the words of, that God has spoken to us, to us through the prophets of the Old Testament and through the teachings of Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament. And from here, he makes a point to summarize the arguments that these false teachers were making for doubting the return of Christ. In verse 4, they say, where is the promise of his coming? Where did he promise that he would come? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. They're making an argument from the continuity or the constancy of the universe, or what we call in kind of philosophy a deist's claim. A deist is someone who believes in God, but they believe that God does not interact or affect the outcomes of this world here in time, space, and matter. But that God is a distant and uninvolved creator, and that in the creation of the world, he simply wound up the world, just like one of those old clocks, right, that you had to wind up. Old people, you remember that? Wind, wound, well, he wound the world up like a clock, set it, and let it be left it to run on its own. And so this is a belief that we recognize as wholly unbiblical. At any moment in the history of the people of God, we see miraculous works of power, whether it's the parting of the Red Sea for Moses and the people of God, whether it's the giving of the law on the tablets and the Ten Commandments, and especially in the incarnation of Christ, Christ becoming flesh, God becoming flesh. In all of these things, we see that God is extraordinarily involved in the courses of this world and in human history. The Apostle Peter even uses examples from the Old Testament to refute these claims of the false teachers. If you look at verse 5, he uses imagery from the creation account from Genesis, as well as the flood account with Noah and the ark, putting forth this idea that God... Um, was not only intricately involved in the world at its creation, being formed by the words of his own mouth, but also in how God 
judges wickedness, specifically in how he judged the wickedness of the world when he flooded the earth in the days of Noah. Peter is making it abundantly clear that God is not disinterested and uninvolved in the world today. And yet, arguments like these false teachers are making gain traction still to this day, even among our intellectuals. From the earliest of human history, greater men and philosophers than I have been asking these kinds of questions. How can I really believe that God is going to finally judge the world, and all of its evils and atrocities? How can I believe that? If you look back at all the evil that has already been committed in this world, all the genocides, the Holocaust, all of the war and famine, out of all the evil that's already been committed, those would have been as good a time as any to bring about swift judgment. But just as Job cried out before God in his suffering, why do the wicked prosper? Or as Asaph says in Psalm 73, I envy the arrogant and the prosperity of the wicked. They don't struggle like we do. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens and are not plagued by the same kind of ailments that we are. Therefore, God must not be involved in creation, nor does he care about justice in human affairs. These are the kinds of questions and statements that we see made even to this day. And so while we can prove from the scriptures that God does indeed intervene in human history and longs to relate to and interact with his creation, we still need to have an answer to the questions people are having about God's timing and why so often it seems like he doesn't care or it seems that he's disinterested in human affairs or that he doesn't seem like he's going to be coming back to do this total overhaul over creation at the end of time. And so that's what Peter is seeking here to answer in verses 8 through 10 in this last chapter of 2 Peter. So here's how I think I would characterize the reply of Peter's main argument to these false teachers. That even though it may appear that God is somehow delayed in bringing his justice through the second coming... Jesus can still be trusted to return and to bring about the judgment day of the Lord and is not delayed in bringing about this justice because of the fact that God's experience of time is qualitatively different from ours in both perception and in purpose. I'll say that again. God's experience of time is qualitatively different from ours in both perception and purpose. That is why we cannot, in our flesh, reason our way to understanding God's timing and God's plan specifically in Christ's return. Let's look at what I mean when we say that God's sense of timing and his experience of time is qualitatively different from ours. First, we said that God's perception of time is different from ours. If you look at what Peter says in verses 8 through 9, he says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. First and foremost, we need to recognize that God is holy. And his holiness means that he exists qualitatively on a different reality than we do. We are what we call finite creatures, right? We exist within time. The past cannot be revisited for us except by way of memory or record. The future can only be experienced as it unfolds to us, and even that only one moment at a time. But God, however, again, exists qualitatively different from us. He is infinite and exists outside or above our temporal reality. He sees past, present, and future realities all at once. And he is not only the creator of such realities, but his word says that he is the intricately involved sustainer of said realities. He upholds all of these realities by his power. In Isaiah 46, God declares, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. 
and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all of my purposes. And so while we exist here as finite creatures within time, and we can only experience time moment by moment, God exists differently than us. He exists uh, transcendently outside of time, and as he declares and knows the end from the beginning, he sustains all things by the word of his power. Now, not only is God's perception of time or his experience of time different from us, but his purpose in, of his timing is also qualitatively different from ours. Look at what he says at the rest of verse 9. It says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some may count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The argument here is that God, in his choosing to make the day of his return later than how we might expect or how we might think he ought to come, he is totally purposeful and meaningful in his timing. Verse 9 is very clear. His uh, purpose for us, in, is his desire for us, is to be patient with us. Because he does not wish for any of his elect to perish. So his purpose in his seeming delay, again, in, in the ways that some might count it, in the seeming delay of his return, his in purpose and his intention is to give the true believers among the visible church from that time till now, time and opportunity to grow in grace, in knowledge of him, and to resist sin and stain from the temptations of this earth and from the deceitful words of false teachers before he returns. And now this actually brings up a really difficult question about what Peter means when he says God desires that none should perish but reach repentance. If God desires all to be saved, then why aren't they? Scripture, it, it, rather, if Scripture is true, when it says in Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens, he does all that he pleases. If that is true, does that mean that God will call all to repent and to accept him at the end of time? Well, I think from what we've just been reading through the rest of this passage that we can categorically deny a claim like this, since Peter has been echoing the entire claim of Scripture that there is judgment for sin, and that there are many who, and just as Jesus said, there are many who will not walk the way and will perish, that there will be some who do not accept him and will not reach repentance and so how is it that God can never be thwarted? On one hand, he can never be thwarted and that he does everything that he sets out to do in his good pleasure. Yet, if, if he pleases that none should perish, why do some perish? And I think that this, the key to this uh, theological difficulty is actually quite simple. If we would just read the literary and the grammatical context of what Peter is actually saying in this verse. When, verse, when in verse 9 he says that God does not wish for anyone to perish or any of you to perish, but that all should reach repentance, the question we need to be asking is, who exactly is all? Does not wish for all or any of you to, reach, to perish, but for all of you to reach repentance. So who is the all? We notice that in literature, not every time we use the word all, it, does it truly mean absolutely everybody in any given scenario. You have to look at the context of what he's talking about. Jesus, uh, think about this, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 14. Classic miracle, right? Jesus has a crowd of 5,000 people people listening to him preach, and he miraculously multiplies a gift of five loaves and two fish. You guys know that story, right? Five loaves, two fish, in which Jesus makes a miracle dish. He multiplies these, this food in order to feed all of those 5,000 plus people gathered to listen to him. And then in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 14, it says that they all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and all of them were satisfied. 
Now, let's ask the question. When Matthew wrote this account of the feeding of the 5,000, does this mean that when Jesus fed the 5,000, that every single person on the planet, dead, alive, or yet to live, were fed and were satisfied? Of course not. But the passage says all were satisfied. But you got to read the context. You have, to, you have to understand what the author's intention was in writing. And so now when we look now back at verse 9, when Peter says that God desires that all would reach repentance, who is the all? Well, if you look back at the antecedent in the beginning of that sentence, you realize that the word is you. You are the antecedent. You are the all. God is being patient towards you. So who is the you that, he, that he's talking about? Remember, we have to look at the author's intention. Peter's intended audience, which was the true believers among the church. He's not even talking necessarily about the entire visible church. Because he's actually talking about a big uh, group of the visible church. He's talking about the false believers and the false teachers in the church. He's not talking to them in a lot of these cases. He's talking against them in many of these cases. He's talking to the remnant of true, born-again followers of Christ that existed in that church at that point and that continues to exist in every age until the return of Christ from the first century to the 21st century. And so this is who God desires not to perish. It is all of you whom Christ knew and chose and called before the foundation of the earth was laid and as we were reminded of back in chapter 1 of this uh, of 2 Peter, that Christ's call to us is we, what we call an effective call, it means, which means that it accomplishes that which it sets out to do. It is not just words in the air that return back void to God. It means exactly what Jesus said back in John chapter 6, where he said, All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this is Christ's purpose in his seeming delay of his return, that the true believers among the church would be able to come to a saving knowledge of Christ, perhaps even those who have yet to make that profession of faith, and that by the growing in grace and knowledge and power in the Christian life, that they may glorify God when he returns and when, when Christ comes and makes all things new, and that they may enter into the joy and peace of his rest and enjoy him forever. And so now, uh, when we think about ourselves in this broader context, for those among us this morning, to whom the Holy Spirit has borne witness to your spirit, right? As, as, as it says in Romans 8, he's borne witness to your spirit that you are indeed born again children of God. Let it be both a great warning to us as well as a great encouragement to our hearts this morning that God, in his divine purpose in delaying his return, was not to leave you alone in your suffering and in all the effects of, the, uh, of the, the effects of sin on this fallen world, but that he's using this time to be patient with us, to draw us to himself, even as we struggle in this world and in these bodies of sin to draw us to deeper manifestations of repentance and to deeper manifestations of his presence and in deeper manifestations of obedience to him in all of the areas of our lives that he is calling us to surrender and in these areas that he is refining us. But also, this is meant to be a warning to us that those who are among us this morning or watching online who are not sure about where they stand before God whether you have yet to put your faith and trust in him, or perhaps you have once made a profession of faith that did not come from the heart and was not genuine. Peter is clear to us this morning that none of us know when Christ will return. Verse 10 says that it will come like a thief, unexpected. 
And so with the time that you have now, having heard the eternal words of life in the gospel, this is your chance to respond to his love and his grace towards you by repenting of your sin and trusting and putting your trust and faith in Christ for your eternal life. If you should reach repentance, you are indeed among those whom God loved so much that he sent Christ to die a brutal and wicked death in exchange for your sins' forgiveness. He loves you and he is calling you. Come and accept his grace as you hear this and you are given even a seed of faith to respond, at least to say, I want to know more. Press into that. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we spoke of of God's purpose in this supposed delay of his return. But Peter also explains the purpose of God's judgment upon the earth, resulting in these, what we call the, this burning up of the heavens and the earth that exist already. After reminding us about the judgment of God upon the earth through the flood of Noah, Peter reveals to us God's future plan for judgment. Look at verse 7 with me. It says that by the same Word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So the judgment of God is not just for the wicked, but it's going to be the mechanism by which God begins his total recreation of the new heavens and the new earth. Now skip down to verse 10 with me for a second. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So the fires of God's judgment, again, through the Apostle Peter, God's judgment for the day of the Lord is being revealed to us is firstly to judge wickedness and to judge evil, how he promised but it is also to reveal the lasting nature of the work that we do here on earth. It is going to expose the intentions of our hearts and the lasting nature of the things that we have done in his name. That these metaphorical fires of God's final judgment are not just his agents of recreating the new heaven and the new earth, but rather are his agents of revealing the genuineness of what was done here on earth, what was done in this life was it done with, for a selfish gain or for momentary pleasure or comfort and safety? Or was it done with the intention to impact the kingdom of God by going into all the world, whether it's to your neighbors or to the nations, in order to make disciples out of all the peoples of the world? The purpose of Peter's highlighting this was to get his listeners to become spirit-led, introspective people who look at each moment of their lives as literal worship and service of God to shake up these sleepy Christians. We mentioned a few weeks ago that there are some who were bought by the blood of Christ, who are among the elect, who have become almost sleepy, thinking that, forgetting that they have incredible power from on high to live the Christian life. So he's writing to shake up these sleepy Christians who have forgotten what it means to live for Christ. And he's calling them to examine their lives and to ask the Holy Spirit that bears witness to your spirit. What lasting impact have my actions had on eternity? Remember when Jesus said, don't store up treasures here on earth, things that moth and rust can destroy, and that will certainly at the end of time be burned up with the fires of judgment. But store up treasures in heaven, that which is eternal. Rather, the the souls of those who, without the gospel, would be consumed by the fires of judgment. Once everything is said and done and the end comes and everything is burned up and only that which is eternal will remain What will the fire reveal about the lasting impact of your deeds here on earth? Will it be a life that was lived out of selfish pleasure? Or or one that was lived out of fear of of, of being exposed? Or a fear of stepping out of your comfort zone? Or or, or of a longing of 
for comfort and security? Or will it be filled, or will it be filled with hours of doom scrolling and Netflix binging and finite, insignificant pleasures that will not remain once the new heaven and the new earth are done away with? Or will it be filled with moments of true growth and true transformation of the Spirit? Will it be filled with hours and days of just sitting before Jesus in his word, meditating on it, with sitting before him, asking God with a pure heart to uh, equip us to love him and to know him more deeply and to share more boldly with others the same truth that saved our souls? The same truth by which we are saved and we are redeemed and we are loved. It's not that things like hobbies or uh, social media or downtime are evil. I'm, I'm not getting at that at all. God uses restful practices to refuel us for the work he's called us to. But the purpose of such passages like this are to get us to be an introspective, Holy Spirit-driven people that think about what kind of life we want to live. How do we want to be found when Jesus returns and burns up this world in judgment? What kind of life do we want to live? What kind of power we have access to because of Christ? This is Peter's motivation. Just look at verses 11 and 13. He says, since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people you you ought to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening, rushing the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so as we go out this morning with the truth of this message impressioned on our hearts, do not go away unchanged, church. This is a warning to our mortal souls. Here are just a few ways that I think that you and I can begin to cultivate this kind of kingdom mindset as we leave these doors and enter back into our lives. Number one, be mindful. Be mindful of the lasting impact of our actions here on this earth. Not only in keeping us from sin and remembering that we don't want to be, we, we, that we want to be living for Christ and we want to be staying away from sin and temptation, but also to keep us from discouragement. Sometimes in the mundane things of life, we forget that we are doing obedience to Christ in everything we do, whether it's raising children, whether it's every kind word or deed done to the least of these and many of these things that go unnoticed in this world. Nothing that we do is meaningless. No effort is wasted. But everything we do in the will of God is building God's Uh, kingdom community here on this earth and in the age to come. Number two, we're reminded to check our hearts, the desires that dwell within, to take inventory of our lives and take inventory of our desires and the things that we long for. Do we long to live an easy and undistracted life or are we earnestly awaiting Christ's return? Like like waiting for your lover to get off the plane after months of being apart. You're saying, I just want to see his face. I want him to be proud of me. I want want to please him in every way. Look at what he's done for me. I long for his return. Are we working as to hasten the day of his return so that we could uh, stand before him? Do we love him and long for him in his return more than anything, more than momentary pleasures? more than financial security or comfort, that we would grow in our knowledge of God. And as we grow in our knowledge of God, we may also grow in our affections for him, to see him face to face, to be able to walk into his presence at the end of time, on the day of the Lord, knowing that it was his Holy Spirit that led us through this life to lay down our lives for his kingdom and for his glory here on this earth. We want to be found with a smile on his face, him welcoming us into this kingdom, saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Worship team, please come now and lead us in our response song.
Thank you, Pastor Sam. Um, can I invite you to stand as we respond by singing Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. announcements. Um, we just had our golf day on Friday, and um, I'm still sore. <laughs> but it was a great um, afternoon that we had together. We had 22 people, seven of those who were um, friends that have come to, to join our SCOM golf day. So hopefully, if we have another one next year, we promise we will do it on a Saturday so m more of us can join. Um, so looking into September, I can't believe it's already end of August, um, we have um, our Love in Action Amazing Race. So again, this is an opportunity for us, not just for us to have fun together, but really to extend an invitation to our friends um, that we want to invite to church. So if you are in a small group, I'm sure you've already heard with your small groups that you can put teams together or if you want to put team, a team together on your own, you can, and it's a team of four people. So registration will start this coming Friday. Um, please watch out for the link. And this is for everyone, and anyone can play, okay? So if you have any questions, you can ask me, or you can talk to Sharon. Um, yeah, we will start registration on Friday, and we really hope that all of us can join, because it will be a, a great day of just you know, having fun together. Thank you, Eileen. If you're sore, 
It's a good sore. I know that. <laughs> and, 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 and it's okay to be sore. And, and I promise you for Amazing Race, uh, at the end of September, it's going to be another good sore, too. So I hope we will all join together. I like to just want to thank all of the people who organized the uh, ESCOM Golf Day and uh, took care of all the meals and everything. We had a wonderful time. Not too tan. The su sun was not too strong. So uh, we thank God for the good weather. And thank you for keeping all of us in prayer. Uh, may I invite you to now rise as we close in prayer and receive the benediction? Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your amazing grace. Lord, you, you give us good things when we don't even deserve them. And we want to turn back and be grateful recipients of your patience and your grace. And as the day of the Lord inches closer and closer, we pray that you would help us to live that kind of life that would bring glory to Jesus Christ. And now we pray that the Lord would bless all of you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon all of you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward all of you and give us peace that can only come from heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all of God's people say together, amen and amen. Thank you for being here today. We'll look forward to starting discipleship classes September the 10th. The three new electives are in our announcements. Take a look at them, make a decision, sign up, register, and let us know which one you'd like to attend, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. May God bless you all. Amen.